Have you ever watered a house plant and had all the water you poured into that plant just run right through it? I know I sure have. That is a good example of what it's like when soil has what we call a poor soil food web or poor soil structure or has no soil sponge. When soil's depleted and maybe turn into dirt, then water runs either right over it because of compaction or it runs right through it because there's nothing, there's no uh, soil food web, there's no organisms there to hold it together or hold the water. And when we build our soil with a healthy, vibrant living soil food web, it actually the soil actually becomes like a soil sponge. It becomes a place where it can hold water. So when that rain comes down, you only get rain once in an entire growing season. The rain that does come is held in that soil and used in the best and most prolific and possible ways. And in this short interview with Dr. Elaine Ingham, she does a lot better job of explaining it than I do here. I'm Natalie Forsbauer, founder and editor-in-chief of Heart and Soil Magazine, where we amplify regenerative farming, gardening, and living so that we all can have a beautiful, vibrant world to live in for years to come. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and like and share the videos because it helps YouTube show them to other people who want to see them. And if you haven't grabbed a subscription to Heart and Soul Magazine, hop on over to heartandsoulmagazine.com and grab yours for just $39.99 a year. You make yourself an amazing day and enjoy this short conversation with Dr. Elaine Ingham. Water falls from the sky. What's the first thing it really hits? Well, maybe the plants, but it's gonna go all into the soil. We are, that water needs to be clean it need to, in order to grow plants, in order to grow food. It needs to be held in that soil because later in the growing season, all of those plants are gonna have to reach down there deeper into the soil and get that water for growth in the summertime as it dries down. The roots have to be able to go deep. Well, if you've got compaction, if you have been um, killing the biology in your soil, there is no structure. The roots can't go deep. So now you have to irrigate, you have to water. Where are you getting that water from? So what's the quality of that water coming to you if it's going through a bunch of farmer fields that have had pesticides and toxic chemicals applied to it. Now you have not only that water, but all those toxics coming through, affecting your own property. So we've got to build the structure and hold that water in that soil. If we don't hold that water in the soil, no structure, you've got two choices. Either there's not going to be enough organic matter, so that water just washes right through and down the hill and into the groundwater, into the um, lakes and rivers and streams, and it's going to carry all of the soluble nutrients with it. Soluble nutrients will not stay around the root system of your plants if there's no biology to hold on to that. The other thing that can often happen is because um, your infiltration is so poor, the water hits the surface of the soil, it doesn't infiltrate very far, you've got a compaction layer down here, and that water is going to move very rapidly taking with it a great deal of your soil. So now we've got erosion. And as that, wa that um, soil, as the sand silt clay particles or organic matter is carried down the hill, you can often have a situation where the whole slope fails and you get a massive avalanche of materials into your rivers and lakes and streams and human beings, if their houses are in the way, if the cars are in the way, tough. We have to do a better job of stabilizing those slopes. So I think of California, where we are having just massive um, loss of um, surfaces, massive amounts of that soil racing down the um, mountainsides, the hillsides, into the towns, into um, communities, and, and just absolutely disrupting massive amounts of people. How do we prevent that? We build structure. And that means we've got to have not only um, the organisms, but we've got to have foods to feed them. We have to make certain that we're holding those nutrients, keeping them where they're supposed to be, not slip sliding down the hill for whatever reason and getting concentrated and accumulated in um, surface water, 
in deep water, in uh, rivers and lakes and streams. Everything downstream will be harmed unless we get this biology back into the soil. But can we use composting to, to clean the water to get the chemicals, uh, the pesticides, the glyphosate out of it? Yeah, absolutely. So it's all a question of um, how fast um, can you move that water through a, um, concentrate or a, um, a net um, full of compost? And it's uh, how deep does that compost have to be to get all the toxics out? If it's just a little bit of toxicity, just a little bit of a pesticide, you know, a couple parts per million of a problem, you don't have to have a very thick layer of compost. Um, it will get taken care of. Even if you just put humic acid into that water, you're gonna deal with most of those um, toxic chemicals. They're bound now on the surfaces of the humic acid. You must have biology to take those toxic chemicals and get them put into the structure of the carbon chains. And that's when we really remove those toxic chemicals because now they're part of a normal biological compound. They've been put where they're supposed to be. And that's another thing that the organisms do for you. Well, what's the diversity of bacteria and fungi that you have to have, protozoa, nematodes, microarthropods, that you have to have to perform all those functions? You have to maximize diversity. Because what's the temperature? The organisms that are going to do the job today are different from what's going to do the jobs tomorrow. Um, how about moisture? How about humidity? How about foods that are in that soil? All of those things, you've got to have the right sets of microorganisms present to do the job under whatever conditions are present in that system. And only by maximizing diversity are we going to be able to take care of everything. It doesn't work to put just one species back in there. I, always ha I have to laugh. When Monsanto put out this... Um, the, the ex two very strong bacteria are present in this inoculum. Very strong. What, you mean like Atlas? He's holding, these bacteria are holding up the, the, the soil because they're so strong? What do you mean very strong? That's absolutely ridiculous. That doesn't explain anything to anybody about what those two bacterial species could do. They had isolated those two bacterial species from Pennsylvania. Now, can those two bacteria grow in California? Not a chance in God's green earth. Are they going to be able to do anything in a natural system in California? How about Oregon? How about British Columbia? <laughs> Make me laugh. Those ba two bacterial species are not adapted any way, in any way to function out here. So if you were a grower, ooh, I'm going to buy two real strong bacteria. They just got hoodwinked. They got the wool pulled over their eyes. Where's any data from Monsanto telling you what those bacteria actually do? None at all. So why do people keep falling for that? Come on, modicum of intelligence. What do those bacteria do? We got to do the testing. And I'm not aware of any testing that was done before Monsanto sold it to people. Mm. Well, OK, if you've got dirt, absolutely no biology in the soil, maybe those two species could have helped out, but not for long. As soon as the other organisms wander back into that area, they're going to be replaced. So why did you waste your money? Grateful you joined us for that conversation and interview. If you haven't subscribed to Heart and Soil Magazine yet, head over to heartandsoilmagazine.com Click on that subscribe button and join us for just $39.99 a year. You make yourself an amazing day and I'm really grateful you're part of our community.